Hey guys, welcome to today's video. This is Martin from martinmixing.com and today I want to talk to you about one of the most argued about topics there probably is and this is compression and I get a lot of messages and comments asking me about how much compression to use, what kind of compressor to use and people complain that they cannot hear compression. So I want to address some of these issues and provide you with kind of a solid baseline of understanding of what compression is what to expect from it, most importantly, and also some basic settings that you can use that will work most of the times. This video is not for the professionals out there. I don't think that there are kind of set and forget ways to approach compression, but there are certain ways to make this topic easier and to make the use of this tool easier, and I want to address these. So let's jump right to it. Okay, so I have a really quite diverse song prepared here, which has loud sections, quiet sections, clean guitars, distorted guitars, even some strings, vocals, basses, synths. So I think this song has everything that you'll probably encounter while you make music. And I will break down settings on an instrument by instrument basis that you can use. But first I want to talk to you about a few other things when it comes to compression. One, I think that Compression is the most used, but also the most abused and misused processor there is. I think its use or its effect on your music is way overestimated. I think people are expecting too much from it. It will not give you groove, mojo, vibe, or attack even, or any of these other things that you might expect. The only thing that compression can do is making loud signals quieter so you can make the whole sausage louder in the end okay so let's repeat that compression makes loud signals quieter so you can make the whole signal louder in the end that's all it does and i'm writing in detail about this in my book that will come out in a few months hopefully as well what and what i say in my book already is that compression essentially just folds in the mirrors of your car so you can park it into the tight parking lot at Walmart. okay so there's nothing else it does there's nothing else it can do that's all it does. It makes loud signals quieter so you can make the whole sausage louder in the end. That's it, full stop. That's all it does. Now different compressors will approach this in a different way. They will react differently. They will react faster, they will react slower to the signal that goes above the threshold, which is kind of your trigger, okay? So the signal going above the threshold, which you have set, is the trigger that signals for the compressor, okay, now it's time to act. And now I'll act with a certain predefined setting. So I'll act by reducing the gain, because that's all it does, it just reduces the volume of something, with a certain speed, by a certain amount, and then once the signal goes below the threshold, it will stop reducing the gain also with a certain speed. So these are the attack, ratio, and the release, okay? So the signal goes above the threshold, the compressor then knows, okay guys, it's time to act. Now what is my commands? What are my commands? My commands are to start reducing gain with a four to one ratio, which means for every four decibels, I'll reduce three decibels. Okay, four to one. So whatever goes above the threshold, you will reduce uh, three quarters of that essentially. So if your signal goes 10 decibels above the threshold, then your compressor will reduce 7.5 decibels of the whole signal, not just the part above the threshold. Okay, compressors cannot split your signal into a part that is above the threshold and one that is below the threshold. It will not affect only the part that is above the threshold, whatever it is, your attack or whatever it is, the part of your signal. It will affect the whole signal, okay? It will affect everything. It's just a volume fader that is automated. That's ultimately what it is, okay? So your signal goes above the threshold, your compressor then knows, okay, it's time to act. What are my commands? Okay, I have 10 milliseconds, so I should relatively quickly start reducing gain. Of course, this attack time also depends on how much it compresses. It will not reduce 20 decibels by 10 milliseconds. Um, and also five decibels by 10 milliseconds. Of course, even if you, you can set your uh, attack to 10 milliseconds, 
depending on how much work your compressor has to do, it will still need a different amount of time to actually achieve the full gain reduction, okay? It's, it's, it's a speed, it's not a delay. This 10 milliseconds is not a delay, it's not a set time, it is just a speed, more of an estimate, to be honest, of how quickly your compressor will start working once the signal goes above the threshold. Okay, so signal goes above the threshold, that's the trigger. Okay, now I have to start working and I don't have to work too fast because my tech is set to say 10 milliseconds. So I start reducing gain. And then once the signal drops below the threshold again, your compressor knows, okay guys, here we go, let's stop working. What are our commands? Okay, my command is to stop working at a slow pace. So it's time to recover the volume by let's say 100 millisecond release time or 10 millisecond whatever it is and the same rule applies here the more the compression the more the gain reduction okay the slower it will actually go so just because you have set it to 100 milliseconds doesn't mean that it will go from compressing to not compressing in 100 milliseconds okay usually you can check the manuals of your compressor um, usually these times are dictated by a ratio of x milliseconds by per 10 decibel okay so it's a speed just like kilometers per hour or miles per, per hour or meters per second or whatever it is it's more a speed than it is a time delay or a set time okay so usually when we refer to attack or release what it means that okay we have 10 millisecond per 10 decibel of gain reduction okay so that means that if you are reducing 20 decibels it will most likely take 20 milliseconds. You can read up on this, uh, I don't want to bore you too much, but yeah, what I wanted to say is that it's used too much, it's used for the wrong reasons, and uh, people are expecting too much from their compressor compressors in general, I believe. I think that most of the problems that you will encounter with your in your mixing, or production, or whatever it is, can be solved with the move of the volume fader or by EQ. And I think they should be primarily solved with EQ and the volume fader, to be honest, because compression, again, it can just make loud signals quieter, so it can make the whole signal louder in the end. If you want more attack, what does attack usually mean on a snare? It's a brighter, more clicky sound. No? So bright, click, to me that sounds more like an EQ problem, okay? So if you want more attack on your snare, chances are you want more brightness on it, chances are you want to use an EQ instead and not a compressor. Now if you really know what you're doing, of course you can use a compressor once you're uh, snare is bright enough and loud enough, then you can use a compressor to kind of shape the transient a little bit, but 90% of the times when I mix, I don't actually compress my snare, at least not on the snare track or on any of the groups, except for parallel chains, which I'll talk about later, okay? So again, let's just repeat this because I think it's very important. 90% of the times when you're using compression, you would be much better off using an EQ or just the volume fader. Compressors suck the life out of your performances. They make your tracks sound dead and flat and boring and choked and all of this horrible stuff, which is exactly the opposite of what the manufacturers are promising you, usually in really fancy videos with really amazing headlines uh, sponsored by amazing artists that, you know, less like uh, whatever. I don't want to get into it too much. You can read about my frustration in my book later on as well. Yeah, I think I've said what I wanted to say, so let's jump into Logic now and have a look at a few particular settings. So before we go into detailed things, I want to first um, talk to you about how and when you should use compressors. So if you struggle hearing compression and you can usually already see what signals will need compression and which ones will not. So let's just have a look at the screen here, okay? Let's look at this guitar clean. If we zoom into it, we can see it is super duper even, like it is a ruler flat sausage here, okay? It's a sausage or it can be a used, um, I'm not gonna say what it looks like, but you know, it's ruler flat, so chances are that here we'll have to use very little to maybe even no compression. We have two peaks picking out, we might want to reduce those, which means we might want to set a compressor with a threshold 
just around here, okay, so it affects this, but doesn't really affect all the rest. It's super duper even, so let's just have a quick listen. And even if you look at the meters here, we can see that the peak volume, which is way too fast anyway for years to really understand, moves between minus 18 to minus 21, so it's around three decibels, but if we take Yes, but if you take an RMS meter, okay, which is root mean square, which is more like what you actually hear in real life, okay? Then it's super duper steady. There is, there is not a lot of dynamics here to begin with. So the, the reason for using a compressor here, there is no reason really to use a compressor here, I would say. But let's move on. So this was a clean guitar. Let's move on to this bass. Let's make the waveform a little bit smaller. Okay, here we can see the bass has a few more peaks and a few more valleys going on here. It's still quite ruler flat, so the body of the sound seems to be relatively even. Let's just have a look at our meters again. So we can see, okay, there's a bit more poking going on. We are moving between around minus one and minus five, six. So that's a bit more dynamics. Let's just check our RMS as well. Okay, so the bass seems to be a bit more dynamic, and of course we know that basses are super duper duper important, especially in rock music. Well, in every music, really, it's the foundation of most tracks. So we know that we might want to get this a bit more even, and we can already estimate how much compression we'll need just by looking at this meter, okay? So let's say the yeah, let's say the RMS, which is our perceived, closer to our perceived uh, loudness, okay, moves between minus 7, 8 to minus 12. So we have quite a bit of dynamics, okay, 4 to 5 dB, which means it would be justified to use 4 or 5 dBs of compression on this particular instrument, okay? Just to get it more even. We can also just, if you cannot hear it, of course, then, you know, check your monitoring, check your acoustics, maybe do an audiogram, go to uh, a specialist and get your hearing checked as well. I know my right ear is a little bit damaged from rocking out a bit too hard when I was a teenager, so I also know not to judge uh, the five kilohertz mid-range only on one speaker on the right. I always put guitars in mono before I EQ them critically because I know that my left and my right ears react differently. So this is not a bad thing, I'm not telling you you are deaf, okay? I'm just saying you should be aware of how your ears work and what your ears can do, how sensitive your ears are. Can you even hear zero dB, acoustically speaking zero dB, without any issues? I know I can for a lot of ranges, but I know I struggle at um, five kilohertz on my right ear. I know I have a bit of problems on the lows in my left. But I still mix, I still make a living with it, okay, and uh, my work gets really good reviews, so that's not a problem per se, and trust me, most of prof professional engineers out there, they have been rocking out as well for decades, okay, so their ears are not as good as you might think, they just know how to use them and they just know how to pick the right monitoring and how to work the tools that they have, okay, so again, this is not a disaster, this is not a problem, just be aware of how your ears react to different kind of signals. Sorry guys, this is the guitar, but still the same applies. We can see that it is super duper even, pretty much ruler flat. We can see that we have some quieter bits, so maybe he's playing something different here. Let's just have a quick listen. Okay, so something really interesting is happening here. So I actually perceive the guitar with my ears to be quite even in volume, and that's because the critical mid-range, okay, the two to five kilohertz range, 
is quite flat, it's very even. However, I can also tell that in this particular section, the guitarist is playing palm muted notes. And this is where some knowledge and some experience comes in. I know that low frequencies are usually much more powerful than high frequencies, okay? So when the guitarist is playing palm muted notes, the guitar will create a lot more bass, which is then visible here Let's just check again. Boom, we get like a 5 dB increase here just because it starts to move down to lower frequencies. And this is then another point I want to make. Before you apply any compression, it is super duper crucial that you fix the, tonali fix the tonality of the instrument that you're working with. If you have a really muddy, say 200 hertz area sticking out in your, whatever it is, vocal, drum, string, guitar, anything, then that 200 hertz will most likely trigger a lot of compression and that's where bad compression then comes from because your vocal is not actually defined and dominated by the 200 hertz. It's more an, an anomaly, okay? It's, it's a mistake. It shouldn't really be there to that extent probably. Your vocal, important vocal range is more from 500 to 3, 4, 5k, okay? So that means if you have a really loud 200 hertz thing poking out, that 200 hertz will reach the threshold of your compression, of your compressor first, okay? So before the important range, which is the 2 kilohertz, reaches the threshold of your compressor and tells your compressor, compressor okay, let's start reducing gain. Your 200 hertz, which might even be a ghost note, it might even be something that you don't want to hear or don't hear at all, your compressor will, st will start working on that 200 hertz. So it's also really important to understand that. I know that our thresholds, I'll show you it this way, okay? I know that the thresholds on our compressors are shown as one line, but what you also have to understand is that this one line also acts on a really broad frequency spectrum. It doesn't just act on one kind of average uh, level that your signal has as a whole, okay? It's not like it sums all the frequencies and then compresses, no. If your 200 hertz is louder than your 2 kilohertz, then your compressor will start working based on that 200 hertz because that 200 hertz will go above the threshold of your compressor first. Let me show you because I know this is super complicated. Let me loop this little section here. We're just going to take this compressor and I'm going to take an EQ, okay? Let's take this section. So we can already see here, I froze this, that the 100 to 200 hertz range is way louder than everything above that. So I know that my compressor, even here in the, the meter it will show you, will start working on this range because I lower the threshold. Okay, let's say this will be my threshold. The 1 to 3k range is nowhere to be seen yet, but the 100 to 200 hertz octave is already above the threshold, which means that my compressor will act on the 200 hertz portion of the signal and not the important signal, not the important bit which I m might want, which is this higher range here, okay? So let's just look, if I boost this even more, I get more compression. You can see the effect and it sounds horrible and what, what is happening here, I can't even undo this, here we go. And what's happening now that because this portion of the sound is telling the compressor, okay, let's make this signal quieter, the attack, the, the dominant range of the sound that I want to hear more, okay, is becoming quieter. This is bad compression. This is a compression side effect that you don't want, okay? So instead of... hearing more of this range, because I applied compress compression in a bad way, I'm actually getting less of this as well, because of course the compressor is acting on this range of the audio. Okay, let's just try this again. Boom. 
The opposite is true as well. If I reduce this part of the signal, which I'm doing now, we will get less compression, of course, because this dominant range, this loud part of the signal, is not telling the compressor anymore to work as hard. Now we're not getting any compression whatsoever and I have not changed the threshold, I have not changed the volume of the signal, I've not done anything apart from using EQ. So, this is a very important rule. Before you start compressing anything, make sure that the sound balance of that particular instrument is to your liking, okay? Make sure that the crucial, the important part of that signal is being heard. In your vocal, it should be the mid-range and the treble. In your kick, it should be an even balance between the attack and the punch, of course, so like 80 to 100 hertz, and then uh, above 2K, I would say. Um, on your guitars, you should hear the critical mid-range as well as you want the body, etc., etc. Sorry, guys, my, comp uh, my logic crashed, but let's move on. Let's just have a look at the strings in this song here. Okay, so these strings are rel relatively clean. I can tell they have already been high pass, but what happens a lot of times... Even as you can see on some extent here is that you get a really low rumble, which is uh, something from the studio. It can be the air conditioning, traffic outside, breathing, stomping, all of these kind of sounds. And it happens a lot that this really, really low rumble between 20 to 40 hertz is actually louder than the usable part of the signal, which is um, all the rest. And this is, of course, a big problem because that really low rumble will again trigger your compression, which you don't want. You want the useful, the good part of your audio to trigger your compression, okay? <laughs> So you can see there's some of this rumble down here. Here it's really well controlled. I think the producer has already used a low cut, but just to make sure that this is also part of the reason why I encourage everyone to always use low cuts on everything at 50 hertz at least, like except for maybe the kick and the bass or synth basses, but nothing will really need uh, frequencies below 50 hertz. Vocals below 80, 70, you can high pass them. Strings as well. So just make sure you have your low cut so you don't get any of these weird anomalies that might be detrimental to your compression. Of course, we also know that if you have a lot of these 20 hertz parts of different signals, they will build up eventually. Once you have 10 of them on 10 different instruments, they will add up and on your master bus you'll have a huge mess of a lot of low rumble and you don't know why your master bus compressor is acting crazy and why your sound sounds choked and undefined and all of that bad stuff, okay? So let's move on to vocals. Okay, so vocals are by their nature very, very dynamic. It's one of the most dynamic instruments that we also have. And we can see on this performance here as well that, let me just make the waveform a little bit bigger. We do indeed have a really big range of dynamics. We have really quiet parts here and really loud parts here. And if we just check our peak meter, we can see we range from Minus 25, 28-ish. To minus 18, so we have 10 dB of dynamic range here already on our peak meters. Let's just check our RMS as well. What happens? Shift and blink of nine months gone by. I don't even know you now. June and July could have been all lost, but somehow it's halfway through. Okay, so we get a similar idea. We have about what did I see here? Minus. 29 down to almost minus 40. So again, it's about the 10 dB dynamic range. And that's quite a lot. So here, of course, I encourage everyone to use that kind of compression to even out the vocal. We want every uh, part to be heard equally. 
If you are not lazy and you want to be a bit more professional, you can also use clip gain or any kind of automation before your compression, of course, to make sure that your vocals are more even and then you can work more on the peaks of the audio to even out the vocal even more, okay? So again, I don't discourage people from using compression, I just encourage people to use them, to use this tool in the right way. Um, because, you know, I, I've uh, reviewed a lot of mixes, more than 2000 in fact, and the number one issue usually is too much compression, bad EQ settings, and then the third one is usually really weird and destructive ways of trying to make a mix wide without actually using double tracks or any of that stuff, but that's for another vid video, I would say. Let's see what else there is. Of course, drums. Let's have a look at the drums. So, drums, if well performed, don't compress them. Why? Usually the problem is not that you need compression on them, usually you want a different tone out of them. Let's just listen to the kick here. The kick is played well, it's hit hard, it peaks around minus 12-ish, quite consistently, the little bit of dynamics doesn't bother me at all. However, what does bother me is that I don't hear a really clear attack and that it's a bit muddy. And again, you might think, okay, attack, oh my god, I need a compressor. No, the attack is not, well, it is also um, a compression matter, but primarily, like most people, when they talk of attack in percussive instruments, usually they actually want to use an EQ, and they just think they have to use a compressor because it has an attack knob, which of course is something completely different. So here what I would do is first fix the tone of this kick, okay? So there is my attack. So I can hear the attack and I have not touched a compressor. It's not, again, it's not a compression issue. It's not that the waveform is lacking a clean transient, okay? It's not that this waveform is lacking attack. I mean, look at this. This is a super duper clean transient here and this transient is the attack, okay? We have attack here, boom, and then a really short sustain. This is a really good kick, so Compression is not the problem here. We don't want to mess with the transient of this kick too much, okay? What we do want, however, is want to hear a bit more of the attack, of the bite, okay, of the sound. And that will usually be solved by an EQ. So there is my attack. Again, without compression, without anything else, we now have a better attack. Then we reduce this nastiness here. A really easy trick for EQing things, okay, is what do I want to hear from this instrument? And what is it that I don't want to hear? So in the kick, I want to hear punch and I want to hear attack. So you can go and take your EQ is this punch? This is punch, yes, I like this. I don't want, I, I do want to hear that, so I probably don't want to reduce that. Is this attack? Yes, this is attack, I want to hear it. And let's check all the rest now. What is this? This is neither punch nor is it attack, it's nothing. It's mud, it's not clear. So let's get rid of that, boom, EQ done, thank you. And just by reducing this unwanted bit, the rest has already become more dominant, but I do want a bit more of the clickiness. So that is my kick, and to be honest, I don't feel like I have to compress this, and I don't think I would compress this in uh, this mix, because it sounds really good. I might put a noise gate on it just to get rid of the bleed between the hits, but otherwise I think this is a perfectly good kick as it is. But if you really must compress it, if you really want to, and I don't think you should, but if you want to, then try to stick to settings that are not destructive as such, okay? So I would go 
with something like so generally speaking a four to one ratio is, uh, is it always works there is it's very inoffensive it's not too little it's not too much it's usually a good starting point a text between 5 to 20 or even 50 millisecond usually work on anything if it's a transient instrument i would try between 5 to 15 if it's anything a bit more sustained vocal um, bass anything like that guitar even you might want to try 10 to 50 millisecond attack okay makeup gain depends like i think this is part of why you often don't hear compression because the makeup gain just makes everything louder and this is where the illusion comes from that it's also better once you compress because our ears perceive things like louder is better that's that's how our ears work but of course this is a myth and this is where a lot of the problems come from when people try to mix and release yeah, 5 milliseconds up to 100 milliseconds again, 5 to let's say 20 on transient heavy instruments like kick snare and then 10 to 100 on vocals, guitars, guitar solos, that kind of stuff where you need more of a gentle leveling action. So let's have a look at what you can do on this kick. So I don't like it to be honest because whatever it is I do here I'm not getting a lot of the punch anymore it seems to choke the sound a bit too much even though I'm not using any aggressive settings but if I make it even more aggressive So I feel like I get a lot more body, I get a lot more weight out of the kick by not having the compressor on. So to me, I, I, I wouldn't use this, I wouldn't do this. I, I think it's detrimental, I don't think it's good for the kick. If you want a bit more of anything on the kick, I would rather do it parallel. And I've talked a lot about parallel compression in other videos, so check those out, especially the metal mixing one. You can check those, I do a lot of parallel compression. However, if you must, if you must, and this is actually something I want to tell you right here. If you really struggle with compression, buy yourself an SSL E channel, any, it doesn't matter, Waves, Plugin Alliance, whichever, and use the built-in compressor here because it works on everything and anything consistently every time and it's really really hard to mess it up. It has quite moderate settings, stick to the slow attack, so this LED on is fast, just stick to the slow attack, fast release, 0.1 seconds, that's 100 milliseconds, that's still relatively slow and then just compress like this and it always works. It has an automatic makeup gain function so you will not choke your synth, will not become quieter as you compress. And with this compressor you can do anything and everything and you know if, if you struggle a lot this this compressor, this channel strip, you can do everything with. If there's one tool I would want to have, it would be this one. And then I would be completely happy mixing any and every song with only this one channel strip, to be honest. It's the most emulated channel strip there is. It's the most used mixing console, the SSL E channel in history, I would say. It's then the most used EQ, the most used compressor, the most used anything and everything. It's perfect. It just does everything really well. And I'll show you later on on other instruments as well. So you can see I'm getting here quite a lot of compression. 6 dB-ish compression. And it still sounds good. I'm still having all the punch, all the attack, everything. It just, it just really, really works. Let's put it off. So this just works. So for drums, just use this and you're good. You cannot mess it up. So if you're really insecure, you really don't feel comfortable with compression, just buy this and you'll feel like a star because it just works. Snare.
Now a snare, same thing, okay? Look at this. Is this not a good enough attack? Is it not a good enough transient? Of course, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Look at it, boom, attack here, sustain out. This is a perfectly well recorded kick, uh, snare. So again, usually the problem here is not that we want more attack in the sense of a faster spike on the waveform. Usually what we want when we say more attack on the snare is again an EQ problem. Does it feel like I have more attack? Yes. Does it feel punchier? Yes. Does it feel more present? Yes. Will this cut through the mix better? Yes. Is this how it should sound? Absolutely yes. Sounds great. Now add a bit more weight to it. Uh, sorry. Here we go. Boom. Snare done. I mean, do you need anything else here? Is there any other problem to No, I don't think there is. So again, for snare, we can use a kind of old school... I mean, I, I don't use this to be honest because it's too complicated. There's too many options. And if you struggle and you don't know what knee is, you don't know exactly how attack and release work and what automatic makeup gain means and what all of these graphs mean, then just don't use these because there's no point in doing that. And if your presets, if you load any instrument in Logic or any other DAW, kind of forces you to have them, just take them off. It's more detrimental to your sound than anything else. But you can use this, of course. I would use a hard knee. Auto gain, why not? I'll have, let's say, a 10 here, something like that. Four to one ish. Let's see. Now this is again one of those examples. So we get a lot of compression here. We do get a much stronger transient, okay? We do in theory get more attack and in practice is where we get more attack out of the snare. But now we don't get a lot of body and this is another problem I hear a lot that because you have a really strong spike in your snare, the rest kind of gets lost and we do need a bit of that body so our ears can even hear the loudness of the snare. If you only have the spike, your snare will, will disappear and this is where a lot of the problems come from in mixes where you feel like you have to continuously keep pushing the snare up because you cannot hear it. Yes, it's because our ears actually struggle with transients a lot more than with sustained notes and with the body of the signal, whatever instrument it is. So what you want is ideally a good attack, a good transient, but also an even distribution of body as well. So again, whereas I do like this, I do get a bit more click from it. I know that this snare might get lost in the mix. So what I would do again, I would just take all of it and uh, just parallel compress it if I must. So I do preserve the body of this and I can blend in a little bit more with some parallel compression techniques, which you can check in my metal mixing video where I've done a lot of that kind of stuff. So everything else, kick, snare, toms, same kind of mentality, use parallel compression, use easy to use and easy to understand compressors. Again, on the snare, I would also, I mean, the SSLE channel is the benchmark, is the best snare processor there is, okay? Again, same thing, slow attack, Fast release, four to one. You can just save this as a default. And even with a lot of compression, this just works. This just sounds great to my ears. And the good thing what it does, it because of this overload here, it will actually shave off a little bit of that really harsh peak, so you get even more of the body as well. So you don't hear it, it will be very musical and very good actually for your snare. 
So this sounds great. So if you're really uncertain, use this. I would stay away from these kind of compressors that give you too many options and are too hard to understand and can be misleading. Use this, you don't even need a meter, just, you know, four or five dB of gain reduction and you're good to go, basically. Let's move on. How would I compress the hi-hat? I would not. How would I compress overheads? I would not. How would I compress rooms? I would, actually, depending on the mix. So in a jazz song, I would just leave the rooms as they are, just to get a bit more ambience. On this kind of song, I would use a crazy setting. I would use like really high ratio, really fast attack, really fast release, really hard knee, and really low threshold to get the really, really strong pumping sound. But this compressor is actually not fast enough, so let's move to, let's try a FET. I mean, of course, we know what this is. This is the 1176, and this will, I think, do exactly what we want. So again, if you don't know what any of this means up here, what a digital compressor is, what a VCA is, what a FET is, what an opto compressor is, then you're better off staying away from these and just use other tools that are making it easier for you. But I'll try to talk about these a little bit as well. So again, the room, I would either not compress it for smoother songs or compress it really heavily like this to just get a really crushed, distorted sound, which sounds cool in the context of the drum kit as a whole, especially in a relatively heavy song like this one. How would I compress shakers? I wouldn't. How would I compress the bass? Now we're talking. As we discovered earlier, the bass is quite dynamic. What I want is, again, I want an even sound first before I jump into compressing it. So let's have a look. This is the worst EQ on the planet. And the same kind of mentality applies here. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. This is kind of nothing. So let's just get rid of it. So this is good, and of course we can see that here there's nothing we can do about making this sound even, and we don't have to because it's not the job of the bass to be super duper even. But we do know now that the compressor, whichever we're choose to, we will choose to use, will act mostly on this part of the signal, which is fine by me because I want to massage the low end anyway. I want the bass to give a really even low end to the whole mix, okay? So again, I have fixed the bass a little bit. I've gotten rid of this something. I mean, this is really well recorded, okay, but still. So here now we have a very typical example of bad compression. Why is that? It's because the compressor, as you can see, never actually recovers to zero. What does that mean? Well, that means that the actual reduction of gain only really happens within, in this particular example now, within the minus five and the minus five, six, seven, maybe eight dB range. So the actual change in dynamics will only be three dB. Let's have a look at it again. So what we have essentially done now is we have made our bass 5 dB quieter because the first 5 dB are never moving, the needle does not move. So we have made our bass 5 dB quieter and then compressed it, we actually started reducing the dynamics of it by around 3 dB. What that means is that our threshold is too low, it's unnecessarily low in this particular case. So let's just use something a bit more moderate.
So the effect that we are getting here is basically the same, except that we are not reducing its volume by 5 additional dB. And we have auto gain here up. Um, the attack and the, the release doesn't matter because it's automatic, but let's just take this off. So now this is quite good compression. We're actually reducing the, the dynamics. The compressor actually recovers to zero a couple of times, which means we're actually getting good working dynamic range reduction, which is the goal of this. We are making the bass in certain parts 3 dB quieter, so the whole thing can become louder in the end by using the make up gain function, okay? If we do more compression with the same settings, What we hear is that we have now just reduced the volume of this instrument by additional 5 dB, but the effect is not very different. I mean, compressors usually react differently depending on what range you're working in, but generally speaking, you shouldn't really get this effect where your compressor is constantly at minus 5 and the needle only moves between minus 5 to say minus 10 because the first 5 decibels of it will add the choke effect, okay? So this is over compression, this is chokey compression and we can hear that the compressor doesn't sound very alive. It sounds a bit too held back like it's trying to break out but it can't because it's 5 dBs of stuff that's holding it back. And of course because this, these are quite subtle settings some transients will still make it true which means that we we get this weird sensation that it's loud and quiet at the same time and that's that's what I really really hate in compression. Okay so ideally you want to set up your compressor that it is always recovering to zero okay and that you get a working range of dynamic range reduction above zero so let's see. This looks pretty good to me, on some peaks it recovers to zero, the 1 dB will not do a whole lot of bad stuff, so this really works, I would say. Regarding ratio, usually you can use 3 to 1, 4 to 1 on anything and it will always work. 90% of the times, it's not too much, it's not too little, it's good. 2 to 1 might be a bit too little on very dynamic instruments, such as vocals, it will be a bit too little because it, it will just be too slow, it's not enough. 2 to 1 you can use on really sustained instruments because it's a really gentle, really musical setting. So I would say 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 90% of the time starting bass, kick, snare, any kind of percussive stuff, um, even vocals. But if the dynamics are not too much on certain instruments and you want a more gentle leveling effect, you know, like on the whole performance, you just want to level it out beautifully, then 2 to 1 works really well, I would say. So let's move on. How would I compress this guitar here, which we have discussed earlier? So we already know that we have a palm muting issue here, where this part will be more compressed than this part. So here we have to use a bit of EQing and a bit of compression magic as well. Let's just have a look. Okay, so this is very interesting because to me the guitar sounds very even actually across the board, except for this part, but what I hear is not an overall loudness increase, what I hear is a bass increase. So this would now be, I'm gonna deviate from the actual topic a little bit, this would be a perfect, perfect scenario for multiband compression, okay? Where I just want the low frequencies to be affected, but I don't want to be the high frequencies to be affected, okay? So this, a multiband compressor does the same thing, but it compresses things across the frequency range differently. <laughs> So 
So I could use something like this if I wanted, uh, just to keep the lows in check. And of course, and well, especially on palm muted guitars, this is definitely a really good way to go. But generally speaking, I do not compress distorted guitars because they are just so even. Look at this. I mean, this is just so, so, so even. I don't think there is a huge need to do it. If you really want to, if you really want to, again, use something really simple. You can use, again, the SSL channel for that. Slow attack, fast release, let's say, again, 4 to 1 ratio. So in my opinion, this works really well. Again, it's a very simple tweak. We have fixed the tone, even though our equalizer is after the compressor, but it's a, it's a fail safe. It, you cannot mess this up with this, to be honest. Just a bit of boost here, a bit of cut at the lows, and then compress it if you want to. This compressor, you cannot do bad things with this compressor, to be honest, if you're really uncertain about what you're doing. <laughs> I like this bit because these little hits are now definitely louder than earlier. Actually, let's just turn off the compressor. Yeah, I dig that. So I would use, again, something like this, or alternatively, and I wanted to talk about this as well. Another really, really good compressor is an LA-2A, and you can use any and every LA-2A, they usually do the same thing. This is an optical compressor, okay? So it has preset attack and release um, times or speeds, and it has a really smooth, uh, from your perspective, smooth ratio where it actually starts compressing before the threshold already with a, 1.5 to 1, 2 to 1, and 3 to 1, 4, 5, and it goes all the way up to 10 to 1-ish, eventually. One thing about optical compressors, and this is perfect way to show it to you that they will react differently in the higher ranges and the lower ranges. So what that means is that the release is very sensitive to the amount of compression. Let's just have a look here. So you can see that it reacts quite quickly up here, but it reacts very, very slowly in the lower ranges. Let's just have a look. So the last decibel of gain reduction for it to recover to zero took nearly three seconds. So these kind of compressors, and this is a good tip, optical compressors like the LA-2A, these vintage tools, are best used in these upper ranges. So here you can break the rule of recovering to zero simply because they're so slow to recover to zero that it's actually detrimental. But I talk about this more when we come to the vocals. So let's see, let's check some clean guitars. As I talked about earlier, the clean guitars here are extremely super duper even. So again, any kind of issue that I may have here is actually not a compression issue in my opinion. So what I would do again is I would try to reach...
So again, I think the EQ has done a lot more than we can any, uh, achieve with any compressor. We have more presence, we have a bit more body, we have gotten rid of a little bit of this murky nothingness. Again, I just checked. Is this presence? No, it's not presence. Is this body? No, it's not. Well then, let's get rid of it. We don't need it. Um, however, if you do want to compress it, and I don't encourage you to do, I don't think it's strictly necessary, although here I think it can be a little bit more impactful, or a little bit more... Um, glued, I would say. And this is one thing, glue on your mix bus, and glue doesn't mean that this one compressor on your master bus, once you put it on, will kind of make, make your super uneven, all over the place mix sound like one great piece of uh, audio engineering. It will just mess things up even more. If you have transients sticking out like crazy, if you have um, crazy volume differences, and if your tonalities are not good, if your 20 hertz rubble has not been taken care of, and your mud is controlling the whole mix or dominating the whole mix, then your master bus compressor will not magically kind of glue it together into something very even. And I'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but on the master bus, one to three dB of gain reduction with smooth settings, that's all you need. And you shouldn't expect it to make a really big um, difference, okay? It's not what it's designed to do and it cannot achieve that. So everything before it has to work, but we'll talk about it later. Let's check the guitar again. Okay, so again, this is, this is one thing that the automatic makeup gain function will make things seem louder, and therefore you might think it's better, but it's not necessarily the case. Let's turn it off and let's just see what the compression actually does here. Or even better, let's make our makeup gain so that the difference between compressed and uncompressed is not um, there, so we can actually hear the effect. So to me, actually, the compressed version now doesn't sound better than the uncompressed. So it actually sounds a little bit restricted. Again, it sounds a bit choked, like it wants to break out, but it cannot. So this is, again, an example of bad compression, in my opinion. And for these kind of guitars, I would stay away from these sort of compressors if you are not certain, if you're unsure about what you're doing. And again, use something like either the SSL, which is a suit that works for everyone, fast release, slow attack, let's say 4 to 1. So it kind of works, but it also doesn't make a huge difference. So if this question exists, then I would just rather not use it, to be honest. So this guitar in my mix will remain uncompressed. I don't think there's any benefit of compressing it. It is super even, except for these two dips, which we cannot really even perceive. I didn't hear this bit being louder, did you? I don't think you did. Yeah, a little bit of attack, but who cares? So let's leave this uncompressed. 
I think the tone of this instrument will be much more important than the compression effect, okay? Than the dynamics of this instrument. Strings, how would I compress them? I would not. Do not compress strings. Why? They are super sustained, it just can damage the whole performance. If you must, like in a rock song, you can get away with a little bit of super duper mellow compression, okay? So this is a prime example where I would use something like an LA-2A, which is known to be super musical and super mellow and super smooth. So you can actually get away with quite a lot of, I think that was 5 dB of compression if you're using the right kind of compressor for this. If on instruments like this that are quite sustained and quite long and quite smooth, optical compressors would be the way to go because they're quite inoffensive, they are not very damaging to your sound in any way, I would say. Unless you do too much, but always make sure that you set your compression so that the needle recovers to zero. If it doesn't recover to zero, except if you go for a really distorted sound, but on normal applications, if it doesn't uh, recover to zero, then you're entering over compression territory and you're risking to choke your sound and making it sound unmusical and get this kind of far but close, quiet but loud, and this really weird effect that I don't think works for anyone. Since, how would I compress since? I would not. Uh, marimba, how would I compress a marimba? I would not. Why would I compress this? It's perfect. If I must, again, LA-2A a couple of dBs just to even it out, but I don't see the need. Vocals. How would I compress vocals? Oh my god, in a million different ways. Let's just take this example here. So, we know that vocals, they have to stick out. They have to be on top of the whole song. They have to be very even. They have to be heard. So, this is one instrument we can, where you actually should apply quite a lot of compression. Now let's start with the really simple ones. Again, uh, make sure that the, the EQ is good, make sure you don't have any rumble. So you'll use a low cut like this. You can also listen to your vocal and say, okay, how, where do I actually set my uh, low cut here? Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down. In the deep. There isn't a lot of content below 200 Hz, so I think I can get away with setting my low cut at 120 Hz, just to be on the safe side. Hands, heavy now, with vocals in particular, I like to EQ them running into the compressor, and that's because, and I talked about this in a previous video, maybe just watch that, in my How to DS Vocals, I talk about this, why you should EQ your vocals before your compressor, but for now I don't want to get too much into it, so here I would fix the brightness, fix the body again a little bit. Hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down in the December glow. So this sounds pretty good to me already. Now in, we are entering a territory which is very important because it's the vocal, it's the main instrument in most songs. So if you are uncertain, again, SSL, you cannot go wrong with it. Four to one, slow release, uh, fast release, sorry, slow attack. And you can compress basically as much as you want. But of course, make sure that your compressor recovers to zero and then you're applying the right amount of compression usually. Hands, heavy now the signal of this is quite weak, so I'm gonna boost it with my EQ by 10 dB. Hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down in the December glow. The shadow hands, heavy eyes. 
So we could say this is done, I would say. Again, SSL compressor just always works. It's basically foolproof, everyone can use it. I use it a lot and it's a really, really good compressor. For vocal, anywhere between two to one to four to one will work really, really well. Let's just see if there's any audible difference. Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down. In the December glow. Yeah, in this case, 4 to 1 is just a bit more aggressive. You can also see it, it compresses a bit more. Let's just stick to this setting because it always works. 4 to 1, fast attack, uh, so slow to 1, <laughs> 4 to 1, slow attack, fast release, boom, always works. Little hands, heavy now, if you like to play around a bit more, then I think vocals are a perfect place for LA-2A style compressors. Um, any of them will work, but I particularly like actually the new Slate Digital one. It's really good and I'm not endorsed by them. They don't even pay me for saying this stuff. But this just really works. And again, just make sure it recovers to zero or in an LA-2A case near zero and I think 10 dB of gain reduction is usually justified on a vocal. Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down in the December glow. The little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down. In the December glow. So I can actually, and this is the good thing, I cannot hear its effect. What I hear is that this attack, this little note is much more level with the rest. It's much more even as a performance. And this is this is good kind of compression. We don't have an obvious effect. It's not over compressed, it's not choked. We don't get any pumping. We don't get any of the negative side effects. It just works. Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down. In the December glow, the little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down. In the deep. So you can hear it sounds a lot more even, it sounds a lot more um, kind of slotted, you know, it will slot into the mix much better. This is a really weird term, but you know what I mean? This will definitely stick out in the mix, it will find its place. There's no weird dynamic fluctuations that might cause problems. So, again, SSL channel, really good. LA-2A, always a good option. If you don't have any of these, I still want to give you an option. You can switch on the Logic Compressor to the Vintage Opto setting. Auto is really good. Um, you can leave all of the rest as it is, maybe just pump up the ratio to 4 to 1 and let's see what we can achieve Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down In the December glow, the little hands, heavy eyelids Drooping slowly down in the December glow. The little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping. We can see it recovers beautifully to zero and it kind of grabs all the rest really well. It is quite a fast compressor, I have to say, for an opto one, but it works really well. Let's just see what happens if we bump up to release, take it off auto. Attack for vocals, I mean, there's a lot of arguments about this. Um, if you're uncertain, just stick to between 10 and 20, 30 milliseconds. Too fast, it will start choking the sound a bit too much. Too slow, it will not work enough. 10 to 15, 20 usually works really well as kind of a baseline, as a do-it-all setting. But let's just see what happens if we change that. Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down In the December glow, the 
So th this is weird, I would say. This, the needle seems to be stuck at minus 10. It occasionally jumps back to zero. It makes no sense to me even just by looking at it. The sound wasn't convincing me either. So, of course, different settings will react differently as well. Heavy eyelids drooping slowly down in the December glow. The shadow hands heavy eyes. So here we are getting a really good compression action. It recovers to zero, it is jumping a lot between minus two and minus seven, which means we are successfully reducing the dynamics of this vocal, the dynamics which are too much, the excess, okay? Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down in the deep. So this works, of course, then we all know that fat compressors are quite popular on vocals. Let's just see. That should be good. Little hands, heavy eyelids, drooping slowly down in the December glow. The shadow hand. Yeah, I actually prefer this one over the opto on this, to be honest. Uh, but again, this is a really subtle difference to hear. If you can't hear it, there's nothing wrong with it because um, it's very subtle details that you have to listen to and this will come over time so you know just don't don't be discouraged that this is a problem this is why i'm giving you these kind of uh, settings that you can always use that always works so again four to one ratio usually works attack between five to twenty millisecond five on transient heavy stuff 10 to 15 to 20 maybe on vocals or sustained stuff release between 10 to 100 milliseconds depending again on the tempo of the actual track if it's a transient heavy one you want a faster release and i tell you why i don't think i elaborated on this let's just go back to our let's say kick here okay so let's take this off and let's just have a look at what happens if my release is too slow. What happens then that the compressor will not recover to zero between hits, which means it is still attenuating the signal. It's still like imagine that the fader is still down, okay? Which means that the first hit that will trigger the compressor will tell the compressor, okay, now it's time to reduce the volume, but then it never actually recovers to zero, which means the next hit will already be attenuated by a certain amount. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at fast release first. Okay, as you can see here, the compressor recovers beautifully to zero between hits. So every hit starts at the same volume, the original volume, and it is unaffected by uh, the, compress uh, the, the compressor. Now let's see what happens when I increase the release to a point where it will affect subsequent hits. Let's have a look. Let's see, maybe 200 milliseconds. Still not long enough. Let's make it even longer. So here you can definitely, I just make, a, I make this really extreme just so you can definitely hear it. But you can hear that the first hit is louder than the rest of the hits. The rest of the hits are starting at minus five. So what you have done essentially is you have lowered the volume by five dB for every hit after the first hit of the kick. Let's see with two seconds. Let's make this even more extreme. Okay, this is going to be good. Let's see. So we have... Let's we have nearly 10 decibels of gain reduction. Boom, we have perfect recovery to zero, so every hit will be even.
I just turned off um, auto gain even so it's even more prominent. Okay, let's. Perfect, every hit recovers to zero, every hit even volume, very good. Now let's pump up the release to five seconds, just for obvious. Wow, so again, what we have done here is the first hit is telling the compressor, okay, it's start to go to work, guys. Let's start reducing the gain. And then once that first hit goes below the threshold and tells the compressor, okay, guys, it's, stopped to work. it's a time to stop working. It's time to release. It's time to bring up the volume to its original le uh, level. Okay, but how fast should we do it? Oh, you have five seconds for it. Don't worry, just take your time. Okay, that's what happens inside the compressor. So what that means is that the first hit will be louder and the rest of the hits don't have the chance to even play at the original volume. So essentially I can sum up this whole video, this whole one and a half hours with a few simple sentences is stick to relatively moderate ratios, two to one to four to one will work with everything most of the time. Um, stick to attacks between five to maybe 20, 50 milliseconds, it will always work. And stick to releases between 10 and 100 milliseconds, it will usually work. That's only if you're uncertain, of course. If you really have a deep understanding of compression, this video is not for you anyway. But if you're starting out or if you have uncertainties, then this should definitely help. And most importantly, I think this is the conclusion of this whole video. Make sure that your compressor can always recover to zero, whether it's between hits on the kick or snare or toms, or whether it's between phrases in the vocal or guitar, make sure that your compressor doesn't do more work than it absolutely has to do, because that's when you get all the choky, nasty artifacts that you don't want. Okay, and last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about bus compression. So, the same thing that I mentioned earlier applies here even more than anywhere else. You don't want compression on the master bus that does not recover to zero because then you're just choking your song. It does not make sense whatsoever. So what I recommend is stick to, a like this one doesn't allow it, but an attack between three to 10 milliseconds will work on most purposes every slow any slower than any faster than that's right any faster than that and it will start choking your trains and it will start choking your sound at least when you really really are uncertain about what you're doing four two to one four to one ratio more than enough relatively fast release so 100 milliseconds or auto release if you want will work most of the time but again it does not replace good mixing. The master bus compressor, you know, glue is just such a misleading term because it will not glue your mix. It will make your mix sound worse if your mix is already bad. It will not even out big, big, big volume jumps. It will not even out bad transients. It will certainly not fix bad EQ, bad panning, phase issues, and any of this other stuff. So when engineers talk about glue, what it means is that one, one and a half, two dB compression that kind of makes the mix a little bit more pretty. Let's just see what I have done here. So as you can see, I'm barely touching the needle here. It's very, very little bit of compression, but I can really appreciate this really subtle effect that it has on my mix. It's a little bit cleaner, and well, not cleaner, it's a little bit fuller on the bass. It's a little bit more even. It makes the different hits, the attacks of the transients line up a bit more mm, nicer, I would say a bit more evenly, but it does not do much. It shouldn't do too much. I. I have made songs without bus compressor. I have uh, seen professional engineers forget to switch it on and then send off the mix without the bus compressor and they realize I actually I don't need it. It's fine without it. So again, if you don't, don't expect too much from your bus compressor, don't expect it to fix your mix or solve any kind of issues that you might have in the mix earlier. Um, it's just a very tiny little bit of evenness and fullness that it can provide. And I would say the tone difference 
that I'm getting here, that little bit of a warmth, that little bit of a fuller sound, I think it's actually because electronic building blocks that are emulated within this classic sounding compressor. Okay, so don't you think it's the effect of the needle, it's more the effect of the topology of this compressor. But let's just see what happens if I do a bit more. So particularly here I can hear this ducking effect. So you can hear that after the kick hits, the guitars kind of start to swell up. And it's not a bad effect I, might, I must say, but I think it's a bit too much. Now, with 4 to 5 dB of gain reduction, I've pl practically flattened out the mix. I, th I mean, it's kind of cool, but I think it's too much here. I'm, I don't like the ducking effect here. I don't like that the guitars become quieter with every kick hit. It's a bit too much. So let's just make sure that the needle recovers to zero a bit more frequently. <laughs> Yeah, so with a slower attack, I can get away with a little bit more compression, around almost 4 dB, but still the compressor recovers, it's really mellow, so anything more than that is unnecessary. If you have more than 4 dB compression, I would even say more than 3 dB compression on your master bus, then you're doing something wrong, in my opinion. You don't need it, unless you're using a really, really, really mellow um, ratio, like you can actually, on, let me just show you, on this compressor, you can have a 1.5 to 1 ratio, which is like super duper mellow. And this is a super mellow compressor anyway. So we can use that. Uh, just uh, see. It's too much, it's too much for me. The kick and snare are dominating the compression too much. I get weird artifacts, I don't like it. So just stick to really, really subtle compression. Um, two to one to four to one ratio, I would say. 1.5 to one to four to one, doesn't matter that much. Um, couple dB, one to three dB of compression. Oh, yeah. And then you can actually get the benefit of these really beautiful processors, but don't expect too much from them on their own. So I think this sums up what I have to say about kind of how to get started with compression and some basic settings that should work in most scenarios. I hope this is really helpful for you guys. Again, I'm covering a lot more about compression in my book. I'll talk exactly about how it's misused and abused, how it should be used, what different knobs do. And I'm also talking about how they work internally because I truly believe that understanding how things work will help you more than me giving you just settings that you can copy paste. I think once you understand how something works, you can apply that knowledge to come up with your own settings because you will understand the foundation and the fundamentals of these processors.
So I hope this was helpful. Please like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. Let me know what other topics I can cover for you. And I'll be seeing you in the next video. Until then, happy mixing. Take it easy. Bye-bye.